Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome again to this uh, Lenten lecture series of the Jesuit Institute with the, together with the Southern Africa province of the Society of Jesus, Social Apostolate. Uh, and uh, today's uh, topic is some lessons from the Catholic social teaching, the best kept secret. So without wasting any time, we'll uh, hand over to Father Peter Knox to, con to give us his uh, words of wisdom and share with us his insights on the topic of ecological conversion, looking at some lessons from Catholic social teaching. Daddy Knox, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shlobo. You always put me under pressure when you talk about words of wisdom and insight and things like that. It's really, it's really neither wisdom nor insight. It's just being able to share with you what is out there in the in sort of the in, entire Catholic world. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate everybody who's been on this lecture series for the last four weeks. We are now in our fifth week and we have only one week to go. So next week is Holy Week. We will have a class, uh, a lecture on Tuesday of Holy Week. And really Tuesday of Holy Week is where we bring it all together and we look at what we can do here in our home situation, in our schools, in our workplaces here in South Africa. Uh, so as Dadesh Lobo said, we're going to be dealing with the Catholic social tradition. There's this book here, which was published in 2004 during the papacy of Pope John Paul II. So it's, um, it's 20 years old already. And it's a compendium that is a collection of the social doctrine of the church. And doctrine means teaching, but not every teaching is a doctrine. You know, not, not every teaching, not every time the Pope opens his mouth giving a catechism or something like that, does it become doctrine. Not every time, not every time a Pope makes an opinion or expresses an opinion, does it become the doctrine of the church. So when we're talking about the social doctrine, we're really talking about the formal statements of the church in encyclicals or in, in um, uh, letters that the Pope writes or, or uh, exhortations that the Pope gives to the entire church. And he tries to lay out the reasons for what he's giving as, as a particular teaching. There's another, there's another way of approaching this, which is to call it Catholic social thought. So it's what Catholics have been thinking in the social order. And therefore, it doesn't only depend on the popes. It doesn't only depend on what we regard as doctrine or the, the official teaching of the church. We've had many, many excellent Catholics in many, many high positions, or many people in, I think of Dorothy Day, for example, who's been very involved in the workers' movement. We've had priests and and lay people like Dorothy Day involved in the church at the coalface, the church sort of being there, right involved with social issues of the time. And what they say doesn't amount to doctrine or doesn't get raised to the level of doctrine, but as part of the whole tradition of Catholic social thought. And I think it's it's important for us to include in our understanding of the Catholic social thought what is said outside of official uh, channels, because very often the church is behind the social movements. Very often something is going on, for example, climate change or biodiversity loss, and that's been going on for 30 or 40 years, and the church has only started talking about it recently. In week two, we had some of the church's tradition. Today, we're looking specifically at what the church is saying about environmental issues. Chapter 10 of this book is on the safeguarding of the environment. So if you don't want to read the entire book, it's a big, thick book. It's available online in soft copy. You can download this entire book from the Vatican website. And you just go to vatican.va and you look for Companion of the Social Teaching or Doctrine of the Church, and you'll be able to get that book for yourself. And it'll take a lot of space on your hard drive, but it's worth browsing through. Most of the official documents of the Catholic Church are available on the website or vatican.va. 
So we're going to have a look at this book, but remembering that it's 20 years old. And so it doesn't include Laudato Si, for example, which was published in 2015. It doesn't include Laudate Deum, which Pope, Pope Francis only published last year, 2023. So we have to understand that when we're looking at this compendium, we're looking at a book which is dated already. Um, the book gives us principles. In fact, you can find many of these principles all over um, all over the web, principles of Catholic social teaching. Here I've taken one little graphic which represents um, many of the principles. Some people say there are seven, some people say there are nine, other people say there are 11 principles of Catholic social teaching. It doesn't really matter how we number them. The important thing is it's about care for the human person because the human person has extraordinary dignity created in the image and likeness of God, and care for human relationships, social relationships, and care for the environment. So these three, care for the human person, care for social relationships, and care for the environment. These are the three major groups of um, Catholic social teaching. And so we look at these one by one, uh, applied to the environment, and how they come into play when we look at questions of environmental importance. The first one, before any Pope started speaking anything about uh, Catholic social teaching, we have the teaching of Jesus. Jesus teaching us to love our neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the greatest commandment. And in Luke 10, the person who asks Jesus that question, he says, but who is my neighbor? And then we, we hear this famous parable, possibly one of the two or three most famous parables of from Jesus from the New Testament, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this is again a middle-aged cartoon. So we read it as a cartoon. Here's the here's the person setting out on his journey. He falls among thieves, they beat him, they leave him lying. Then the good person comes along, the Samaritan comes along, and he, he pours oil and vinegar on the wounds of the of the beaten up traveler, he carries him. Normally we would see a picture of a donkey or a picture of a horse here, but in this case, we've got the son of man carrying, or Jesus carrying the, the victim of a brutal attack. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? So Jesus showing his love for the neighbor and then taking him to an inn and talking to the innkeeper and saying, uh, look after him, I'll pay you on my return. And so then the question is, who is the, who is the neighbor and the one who looked after the person who'd fallen among, among thieves? He was the neighbor. He showed neighborly love. He is the one who is following the commandments. So that's a little bit more complicated in our days because it's not always possible to know who our neighbor is in this globalized, complex, dynamic world. Things that are going on in Africa have repercussions for South America and North America. Things going on in Europe, for example, the fights between Ukraine and, and Russia at the moment, uh, they have repercussions in the rest of the world. So it's not easy as it was in Jesus' time to say, who is my neighbor? My neighbor is all over the world. We have to be able to bring into our understanding of care for our neighbor, we have to bring into our understanding the idea of complexity, that the neighbor could be anywhere. For example, this, pic this graphic taken from the year um, 2014, you see South Sudan is, sorry, Sudan is still a single country. It hasn't been divided into North and South Sudan. Okay, this is carbon monoxide. So there's a, a satellite image or a satellite measurement of carbon monoxide from the burning of the Congo forest or the forest in the Congo basin. And the wind is blowing from east to west and the carbon monoxide concentration is spreading right across the Atlantic Ocean into South America. Um, it's spreading in different directions in Africa. So to east, west, north and south of the actual burning of the of the forest, the forest in the Congo Basin. So when you ask yourself, who is my neighbor? We mean who is breathing in the carbon monoxide from this forest burning in, in uh, Congo? And it's not evident. 
We can look also at, uh, here it says very clearly, this is an image from NASA, North American Space Agency. It's dust coming from the Sahara Desert. And obviously the wind is again blowing from east to west. And this dust is blowing all the way across the Atlantic Ocean again, into the Caribbean, into the north part of South America, say the Guyanas here, and into Texas and California and Florida and the southern United States. And so who's my neighbor from the dust that's blowing across uh, from, from Africa? Uh, my neighbor is all of those people who are breathing the dust from, from the Sahara Desert, from this dust cloud. And the, the scale along the bottom gives us the concentration of Sahara dust in, that can be picked up in all of these places. So the question of who is my neighbor is quite difficult. Whom do I love? Francis of Assisi made it very clear in his Canticle of the Universe that we love the birds and the bees, but we love our sister Mother Earth. We praise to you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, our Mother Earth who sustains us, who governs us, who produces various fruits with colored flowers and herbs. And Pope Francis is quoting this Canticle of the Creatures or Canticle of the Sun of St. Francis in Laudato Si, paragraph one. So in the very first paragraph of Laudato Si, Pope Francis is quoting the Canticle of the Universe. Then Pope Francis develops the idea, the notion of our sister Mother Earth, whom we love, in paragraph two. And I'm afraid this is a fairly long paragraph, but if we just look at what is underlined here, the Earth our Mother requires care. The earth, our sister mother, is crying out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on the earth, because of the irresponsible and abusive way that we've treated the goods which God, with which God has dowed, endowed the earth. And then jumping down to the bottom of that paragraph, the earth is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. So Pope Francis takes the image of St. Francis of Assisi he applies it to the earth and he anthropomorphizes the earth, saying that the earth is like a mother and the earth is like a person which is being treated badly, which is being um, abused and we're using it irresponsibly. We've abandoned and we've maltreated the earth. So Pope Francis says that we really have to, so in the rest of his encyclical, he gives us ways of caring for the earth. So love of our neighbor involves love of the earth. The next principle, or the very first principle really of Catholic social teaching, that is after the gospel teachings of St. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, is the question of human dignity. We've had this already when we were looking at the Bible. We are created in the image and likeness of God. Each one of us has a unique dignity and a common dignity. We were created in the image and likeness of God. Male and female, we were created. Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5 says that God has made us little less than the angels. We're sort of way up there in the top of God's, God's care and God's, God's gift of dignity to creation. And this notion of human dignity is the foundational notion for Catholic moral teaching, for the Catholic vision of the human person. We're created in the image and likeness of God, and therefore we deserve moral, um, we, we, we warrant moral concern. Climate change, floods, famine, all these problems which are going on with the earth, they undermine the dignity of human beings, as we will see a little bit further on. But the rest of creation also has an intrinsic dignity. The rest of creation is not dignified insofar as it is of service to men and women, to boys and girls, to the human race. The rest of creation is good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Every day when God created in the Genesis chapter one account, God said, it, God saw it was good. So it has dignity, it has value, it has worth in its own right, not because it's of service to us. And then we have this little African proverb regarding human dignity. And the important thing is when we see our neighbor face to face, we realize that neighbor is a brother or a sister. Um, 
we may, well, the less we know people, the less we see them, the less we see them completely, the more distant we are from them, the less we understand them, the less we appreciate them. But then when we get to know people, we realize that they are our brothers and our sisters. So that's the first and the most basic idea of Catholic social teaching, the dignity of the human person. Then we go to the idea what's happening now is people are being forced to migrate. This photograph there is from Bangladesh or India, floods in Bangladesh or India. People are being forced to become refugees. And the quotation I've, I've given you here is from the Pontifical Council for, for, my, for Migrant Persons. Uh, we'll go to the reference in the next slide. Every migrant person enjoys or deserves inalienable rights. And these rights must be respected. Every human being has inalienable rights, including a migrant person. And among the rights which is mentioned there, is the possibility to work. Every migrant has the right to work. We've got many, many migrants in South Africa. We've welcomed many migrants. I think we've got a fairly open door policy in our country, and that's absolutely right. We're signatories on the United Nations um, Convention for Refugees. We're, we, we, uh, we welcome people as refugees. And climate refugee is a new category of refugee. It's not people who are fleeing for fear of persecution or fleeing for fear of um, their lives because of political circumstances, but they're fleeing and they're coming to our land and they're going to every land really because they fear that they're unable to survive in their home countries. So the Pontifical Council says that people have the right to work and to employ their abilities and their intelligence. The quotation continues in this part here. Okay. So the International Convention, the Church respects the International Convention on the Protection and the Rights of Migrant Workers, uh, which entered into force in June 2020, July 2023, which Pope John Paul II really endorsed, and he recommended this, this convention, the United Nations Convention. And he says that it's really important for us to permit migrants to make a contribution in the land in which they've they've chosen the land which they've ended up um, and so this is a statement from the pontifical council for the pastoral care of migrants and itinerant people we see in this infographic that by the year 2050 2.3 percent of the entire population of the earth is going to be migrant in one way or another and not just migrants for political reasons, but climate, specifically climate migrants. We'll have 170 million climate migrants by the year 2050, and they have to be welcomed. We see in Africa, in the north of Africa, 6.1% of the population, presumably as the Sahara Desert gets hotter and hotter and it grows, expands further. In southern Africa, 3.5% of the population, sub-Saharan Africa, 3.5% of the population will be migrant because of climate-related uh, disturbances. And so it's a reality. And the church's social teaching or social thought is we have to welcome migrants. And that's not something new. It's not something that goes back to Pope, Fran Pope Francis. It goes back for decades. Another principle is the universal destination of all goods. Everything which God has put on the earth is meant not just for the wealthy or the Europeans or the people living in the global north. God has put everything on the earth for the benefit of everyone. Um, that comes from Pope John Paul II in 1991, Centissimus Annus. Um, God gave the earth to the whole human race for the sustenance of all the members of the human race without excluding anyone, without favoring anyone. And you can find the reference in the compendium from 2004, paragraph 466. So the environment is something which God has given to everyone the sea, the water, the air, the land, um, the trees, the animals, those are for the benefit of everyone and not just for the wealthy few. There's this notion of the common good. 
um, everything. So that comes from the Second Vatican Council. It was expressed in this way in Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. The common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow all people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more completely and more easily. So we're promoting the common good when we're helping people to become fulfilled, when we're helping them to reach their fulfillment, their human destination, their human um, completion, fullness. And then obviously the notion of common good has been studied in philosophy and philosophers have written all about it. But the common good is about everything in society being available for every member of society. Governments aren't there simply to serve one or two individuals or one or two interest groups, but the roads are there for everyone. The parks are there for everyone. The policing is there for everyone. Security is a common good. It's for everyone to benefit from. There's this idea of stewardship, one of the other principles of Catholic social teaching. Um, God wants everybody to care for the earth and to cultivate the earth. It's not about dominating. It's not about um, taking for myself and getting as much out of it as possible. But we care for the earth. We have this common um, proverb. It's I always thought it was an African proverb. It was always presented to me as an African proverb. But some people suggest it's a North American indigenous proverb. We don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. It's not passed down to us from our ancestors. We borrow the earth from our children. So the younger generation is allowing us to live on the earth and to benefit from the goods of the earth. And so it's not that it's given to us and we we own it. We're actually giving it stewardship on behalf of the generations that are going to come after us. And so that's intergenerational solidarity. It's part of the notion of stewardship. And if we don't live up to our obligation, for example, Adam and Eve didn't, um, didn't obey the command that God had given them to cultivate and to till and to be stewards of the earth. They took the apple, which we see down here, under the guidance of the snake, and they are expelled from the Garden of Eden. That whole tragic story, whatever it means, we can read in Genesis chapter 3. Very shortly after the two creation narratives is the narrative of expulsion that we didn't live up to and we don't live up to our obligation to the environment, our ob obligation to the earth. Um, with this picture, which is by, by a Korean artist, South Korean artist, there's also the dove here, the dove of peace, the dove of the Holy Spirit, perhaps representing the Holy Spirit, that we're not completely abandoned, that we're not completely driven out for all eternity. The Spirit of God is still there hovering over us, even when we're in exile from the Garden of Eden. There's another principle which is known as sub interdependence or solidarity. We all depend on one another. We no person is an island. Uh, we always have to be helped by other people. And in helping other people, in holding hands, we help other people to become who they are. There's this proverb in Zulu, which is about Ubuntu, about our humanity, about who we are as humans. It's, it says that a person is a person through other people. I become who I am because of the other people who've made me who I am. My parents, my brothers and sisters, my community, those who've taught me, those whose words I read, um, people in the church, I am a person because of other people who look after me, who've looked after me. And so I've been looked after and I have the responsibility to be in solidarity, to be caring for other people, even those who are not yet born. And when people's lives are upset, we have a responsibility to care for them after, for example, floods in Durban or after uh, felt fire or forest fires up the West Coast in Cape Town, and things like that. We have this responsibility to care for people whose lives are completely turned upside down by climatic events or environmental events. 
One of the other important principles of Catholic social teaching is option for the poor. The whole community is strengthened. The whole community is held together and is more united when we care for the most vulnerable people in society. Social fabric doesn't collapse and doesn't fall apart when we actually kind of making sure that the people who are weak in the social fabric are actually being cared for, the most vulnerable. So the principle of option for the poor is that we should always consider the needs of the poor. Those who are most affected by severe weather events, people who suffer the loss of land, people whose houses are flooded, people who um, don't have fresh water. I've kept this picture on my wall. I've had it for five or six years now. It's from a, it's, well, I got it when I was in Nairobi. It's from a Nigerian artist called Chinelo Obi, and she's called it the boy on the rooftop. And I don't know whether you can see there's a boy up here standing on the roof of his house because the house and the houses around him have been completely upset, torn upside down, washed away by the floods. And here we have some people, some survivors of the floods in a boat, and maybe they'll come and rescue this boy on the rooftop. But for me, this is a real expression of how we have to care for the most vulnerable, how we have to go out of our way to help those who are vulnerable. And so this boy on the rooftop is one of those who's calling on us, expecting assistance from us. And care for the option for the poor means an option for those who are most affected by severe weather events, etc. On my right-hand side, your left, as you're looking at the picture, is, I'm sorry it's not terribly clear for you because it's abstract art. It's, it's a horse, at least I can see where is it. There's a horse, there's somebody sitting on a horse, and there's somebody on the right hand, the right hand side as I'm looking at it, of the picture as you're looking at it. And that person is leading the horse. And so, it's in fact called the royal family, this picture here again by a Nigerian artist. It's about people who escapees, they're running away from political oppression or climate oppression. So option for the poor is another principle of Catholic social teaching. And we have this, we have this man is not a Catholic at all. He's not Christian, he's a Hindu, the first president of India, independent India. And he says, you can read it while I'm talking through it, when I'm thinking of what I have to do, when I'm thinking of um, what, what needs to be done and my ego is getting in the way, when I'm just thinking of myself or the people closest to me, then I really have to recall the face of the poorest person whom I know, the weakest man, he says here, whom I know. And I think what would be the effect of what I'm planning to do on that poorest person? Will it restore him or her to his dignity or her dignity? Would it lead them to greater autonomy, greater independence? And, and Mahatma Gandhi said, once I think of that person, then I really don't have to wonder anymore about what needs to be done because it becomes clear to me uh, the, 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 the care I have to give to that person. He used this talisman for national policy, but we can also apply it to ourselves. What would be the effect on the poorest person I know of whatever, whatever action I'm proposing to undertake? Another principle of Catholic social teaching is the principle of participation. Everybody has a right to participate in the economic, the political, the social, the cultural life of their society. Everybody has a right to raise his or her hand and say, this is my thought, this is what concerns me, this is my problem if we're going to start mining in the Kruger Park, if we're going to start fracking in the Karoo, if we're going to start mining for oil or prospecting for oil off the south coast, the kind of this eastern Cape coast. Everybody has a right and almost a duty, an obligation to say what he or she thinks about public policy. The right comes with privileges, the privilege of citizenship, but the duty as well to say and to speak out about what is good and what's bad for the environment. 
So participation is another principle of Catholic social thought. Subsidiarity, that's a technical word. Um, it's called subsidiarity in Catholic teaching. It really means devolution of power, or it means something like decentralization. We don't ask the Pope to make decisions for us every time the bishop needs to spend 50,000 rand. We, in fact, even the parish priest can just ask the bishop. It doesn't have to go up to the Southern African Catholic Bishops Conference. At every level, there's a, there's a certain amount of responsibility which we have to take for ourselves. Decision-making should be taken at the lowest possible level, the level where the effects are felt. Um, do I spend money on petrol? Do I spend money on a new vehicle or a new phone or whatever? Um, people at a higher level shouldn't necessarily be taking decisions on behalf of people at a lower level. It interferes with their autonomy. Pope Francis has a more recent teaching or more recent idea about subsidiarity. He says that everyone has a role at his or her level to be involved in healing of society. It's not like the Pope or the Bishop is going to tell us what to do. Everybody at his or her level is involved in healing and healing of society. There's no need to call the army in, for example, when, when elephants are raiding your mini fields. You get local solutions for local problems. Local people should be involved in local solutions. And Thabo Mbeki had a famous quotation about that. African solutions for African problems. I don't know whether you remember that uh, when he was talking about the African Renaissance. He was saying we don't need to go to the United Nations or we don't need our former colonial powers to tell us what to do. We look for African solutions for African problems. There's a principle of association. Um, we are free to organize and to associate with individuals and groups who have similar cares and similar interests to our own. Um, for example, I give you, this is an example, not necessarily the only one, the Laudato, Laudato Si movement can connect us to other people who have similar concerns with, with ours. If I'm involved in schools, there's a whole section on Laudato Si movement platform to deal with schools. If it's about curriculum design, if it's about home, family life, religious life, um, national policy on the Laudato Si movement website, there are Catholics and in fact people who are concerned about the environment from all over the world who put their um, contributions on there and they can inspire us, they can network with us, and they can, this kind of sharing helps us when we're getting stuck for ideas or when we're getting stuck on, on what to do next in caring for the environment. Or we could join a kind of little political movement, Fridays for the Future. We're encouraged by Catholic social thought to be involved with other people with other concerns. Or there's an organization which is kind of worldwide. It's not specifically Christian. It's not specifically Catholic called 350.org. Um, and they're suggesting ways that we can keep the... Uh, concentration of carbon dioxide below 350 parts per million in the in the atmosphere. That's why they've got that name, 350.org. And there are all sorts of other ways and other groups which we can involve ourselves with who are concerned about the environment. And you find your way, you find your people with whom you will associate, and that's encouraged by Catholic social teaching. There's the idea of the dignity of workers. Workers should Everybody should have the right to doing productive work, to fair and decent remuneration for the work they've done, for what the, they've produced, the produce of their hands. They should be safe in the workplace. They shouldn't be using um, unsafe gear, unsafe clothing. I remember when I was working in one of the mines uh, many, many years ago, we were working in the uranium plant, and I was sucking up um, uranium uh, uranium solution using a pipette. We wanted 50 milliliters, so you put your head in the, into a bottle or a flask and you suck it up. That's concentrated uranium. And we didn't bother about the safety issues at the time. And the company I was working for wasn't particularly concerned about the safety of the employees. 
um, everybody has the right to organize in their unions or in in um, trade unions or things like that. Everybody has the, the right to benefits if they become unemployed. So dignity of the workers, people working in environmental concerns, that dignity is there as well. And it's it's enshrined in Catholic social thought or Catholic social doctrine. Promotion of the family. When families have to move, we've seen those people in the floods in Bangladesh, when people are faced with drought, as we, as we know, and as we've had in South Africa as well, and in Southern Africa, the family has to be protected as a group. The family should be strengthened and supported, um, often at, at national level. Very often when families have to flee, they go in all sorts of different directions and they don't end up together. And so families may lose one or two children along the way. You may have read the story of the Dorstland Trek by Herman Charles Bosman. And on the Dorstland Trek, it's so dry and it's kind of and people are dying along the way. And the child who dies is just dropped off the back of the ox wagon and the family continues. And that's one of the earliest narratives, one of the earliest stories we have in South Africa of climate migration. That's not something brand new. It goes back many, many years. And the little child, so the family are moving forwards. They're moving further west, actually, which may have been a mistake trying to find a land where they can where they can survive. They're going through Botswana, they're hitting the Kalahari Desert, they're part, part of the northern Karoo, and they're suffering and they're struggling. And the family stays together until one by one, little members of the family are dropped off the back of the ox wagon. Um, families should be strengthened, particularly when environmental conditions are threatening social stability. The church, the government, whoever, NGOs, people involved in emergencies should be looking after families as family units. Another um, principle of Catholic social teaching is the pursuit of peace. When ecology collapses, then conflict comes. When people are struggling over water, when people are fighting over food, when people don't have enough land, for example, because land is getting drier and drier, um, then conflict arises, conflict over resources arises. We're not talking about conflict over mineral resources. We're not talking about extracting minerals and things like that. We're talking about basic survival. When people's basic survival is challenged, then uh, conflict arises. And we have to do everything we can do in our power to preserve peace. And Pope John Paul II said, peace is not simply the absence of war. Peace is a way of people living together in, in a kind of, in a, in a peaceful manner with each other, being able to share the goods, the resources that are available. There's a precautionary principle. In a way, it's a little bit like the talisman from Mahatma Gandhi that I cited earlier. We always have to be cautious that something is not going to go haywire. We have an image here. So the image I've, I'm presenting us here is the manufacturing of chicken protein by, uh, by genetic replication. And so we've got these, these, these vats here where artificial meat is being manufactured. And we've got a man kind of looking after the, looking after the manufacturing of chicken meat. Um, and we have to be cautious. We don't just throw ourselves into it 100%. We can have Frankenstein burgers or Franken burgers, or we can have, we don't know what the benefits and what the problems are going to be. So we always have to do some kind of environmental impact study before we go ahead and do anything which may have a negative effect on the environment because often it's too late to undo the damage that has been done. If a wetland is drained, for example, there's no way to restore that wetland, or it's very, very difficult to restore a wetland. If we release this kind of um, genetically modified or genetically manufactured protein into the world, we don't know what the, what the consequences will be. People will say they're just cloning the cells of chicken uh, muscle, Chicken, chicken flesh, but we haven't a clue what, what it'll be. So we have to use the precautionary principle. 
We don't jump into something until we're absolutely sure that it's safe for the environment, it's safe for human beings, it's safe for other animals or plants that may come into contact with that material. And then the final slide, the final principle of Catholic social teaching is that everybody should have a safe and healthy natural environment. Um, you'll find this Pope John Paul speaking to the European Court of Human Rights in the year 1988, so very early in his papacy. And that has then become enshrined in the, the Catholic social doctrine, the right to a safe and healthy natural environment. Uh, the United Nations Environmental Program, I'm, I'm a great fan of theirs. I read quite a lot of what they produce. You can never be completely on top of it. Um, but they saying these are some of the rights some of the rights to things, to substances, to substantial things that people have. They have. We have a right to a safe climate. We have a right to clean air, to healthy ecosystems, to healthy biodiversity. We have a right to safe and sufficient water. We have a right to healthy and sustainable food. And we have a right to, to an environment that is not toxic. And so there are all sorts of conventions at every level of the United Nations, also in the African Union, where we have all sorts of conventions about safety and the safety of the, of the, hum the environment we live in. I finished a little bit early, so Ndadetlobo, if you'd like to take over, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank, thank you, Ndadetlobo. I haven't seen any question on 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 the chat box yet. Um, okay. I'm sure, uh, I don't know if maybe you've managed to confuse all of us, or you were so clear that uh, there is no need for questions. But I don't know if there's anybody who has a question. Something that has always intrigued me, uh, maybe uh, you can uh, say something about that if, if, if you have uh, insights or thoughts on it. It's, you know, we talk of the Catholic social teaching and people like uh, the great Pete Henry, they've said, or they've labeled it, labeled it as the, the best kept secret. But it's, it's, teachings or, or, or yeah teachings of the church on practical things that affect people's lives and yet we don't see it as part of the integral formation of our catholic faith like when we do catechism classes or confirmation classes it, it, it's not included there and okay, yet I'm, it I must say sorry i have to agree with you when i was learning catechism i was learning all about the sacraments which are important in the liturgical life of the church. I was learning all about sexual morality. I was learning all about kind of love and care and things like that. But I don't think I ever had a catechism lesson on care for the environment or Catholic social teaching. Um, we're told yeah. to look after the poor. Obviously, that's that's part of our part of our kind of Catholic tradition. Um, but I'm not sure. I ever learned anything about Catholic social tradition? I don't know. Maybe there's some no, I, some catechists on on online this evening. Maybe you'd like to add something in the in the in the box here in the conversation box, or whether you've been exposed to Catholic social teaching as part of your catechism formation over the years. It doesn't look like anyone <laughs> is brave enough to say something about this or give a comment on that or a question. Um, okay, Tony. Hello. Hi, hi, Rampe. It's Kathy. Hi, Kathy. <clears throat> um, it's it's just a comment. Uh, nothing in when I went to catechism, but certainly nothing presently either. 
So that is something that has to be looked at yeah. in yeah. present catechesis. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. We Claire, just see the Claire. message from Claire Stannard, who says it's included yeah. in the RCIA program. So maybe for adult education or for training of, of adult Catholics, we learn about the Catholic social teaching. And really, I mean, Rampe, without wishing to give away your age, uh, you were born before the compendium and you were catechized before the compendium of Catholic social teaching was, was published. And now that compendium has become more available and more accessible. I think maybe um, it's available online, as I said, maybe more of us would be able to refer to that and say, what does the church say about migration? What does the church teach us? Or what have the popes over the years taught us about the environment, about care, about pollution, about care for our mother? Um, okay, so Erica is telling us that it's included in the CORD program and the LifeBound RE curriculum. Okay, thanks, Erica. <laughs> Sean, Sean, I think Sean has got his hand up. I don't know if Sean is, he's got a, a, a different experience. Um, yeah, no, I, my experience was in a way similar. I think um, I also had no exposure in my ordinary catechism to Catholic social teaching. It was only at youth groups and that when we invited, just almost by chance, because we didn't know what it was about, we invited the justice and peace guy at our parish. He, uh, he was charged with the Justice and Peace Ministry to come and give us a talk at our youth group. And I was like really blown away by it. I, I remember just thinking, "How this is incredible stuff. And we and I'd never heard of it before. Um, so I, in a way, I'm corroborating that experience. But I must say, when it is taught, it is it, it is still not taught well and it's encouraging and exciting. So I don't know why we're keeping it a secret. Okay, thank you. Sister uh, Biddy Biddy, 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 yeah. has just sent a message saying that, or asking actually, do we hear it taught in our pulpits? How many priests actually speak about the social teaching of the church uh, in the pulpits? And, and really it should be taught without kind of singling out, I think, political parties or specific individuals. I think in a pulpit, we, we can't use that space, those of us who are priests, or that, that platform for sort of hammering out our own political views and things like that. But we can inform people about the social teaching of the church. I'm, I'm afraid, Sister Biddy Rose, you've obviously never listened to my sermons because they come up fairly Catholics. Well, the concern for the environment comes up frequently in my homilies or sermons. Um, but I think I'm fairly unique in that. Yeah, I would also say that, I mean, when I was parish priest in Nyanga in Cape Town, I also uh, quite often preached about uh, uh, the social teaching, especially the principles of, of the Catholic social teachings that uh, Father Peter Knox has spoken about. And I I also insisted uh, that it be included in, in the program of uh, preparation for the confirmation class, especially the ones who were in their last year for just before confirmation. So I think it also depends on how pre or, or whether priests are interested in, in this area of social justice or not. And uh, yeah, many people have said that, you know, they've never heard of it, but uh, in parishes where priests are in, interested in either social justice or environmental justice issues, uh, you find that congregants they have heard of this uh, social teaching. Okay, thanks, Dr. Um, Tony Rowland wants to say something. Um, yeah, you know, I, I love this uh, the, the topic of subsidiarity. Are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you, Tony. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, I've always been intrigued by subsidiarity, and I like to apply it in the parish. And I think that, you know, the priest should allow the catechetical people to make some, you know, some recommendations about their own programs. And, you know, those who are dealing with environmental issues to run season of creation programs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you bring that back to a family. 
okay, subsidiarity in a family? Are we going to allow the children to make the decisions for the parents? You know, we don't want to apply it across the board. We want to apply it where it suits us. But, you know, I think family life is a very good place where we learn the practicalities of, of all decision-making and relationships and so on. So, you know, I think we need a lot of debate on the subject of subsidiarity. And I think it's a very important one. Yeah. Um, if I may reply to that, um, subsidiarity says, and I try to say that we take decisions at the level that concerns us. So children don't take decisions on behalf of, they can certainly give input on behalf of their parents, but they don't make decisions. Mom, you're not going to work today, or dad, you have to change your job or something like that, or we're going to have um, we're going to have ham and ham and cabbage every day for the rest of the week. Children don't make that kind of decision, but where they're making decisions regarding their own level of society, I think once they have the maturity to do so, they should be able to do so. Am I going to swim or am I going to play? Am I going to do my homework now or will I do my homework later? Um, they don't. Their decisions don't dictate the decision of the the this the fate or the the activity of the entire family but at their own level i think children are, are certainly very encouraged to make decisions i see there's a question here from... in that note, uh, yes. just in that note, before you go to mark's question uh, i just wanted maybe if you could uh, say something about uh, the difference between subsidiarity and synodality uh, because you know, we 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 have been at least we have been having uh, some uh, workshops here at, at Saint Martin's with the school kids, and what keeps coming up is that when the child the the learners go home, they say they come up with this information on taking care of the uh, or, or ecological conversion. It may, I may put it that way, and they say they always get resistance from parents or their grannies because now they come up with new ideas that challenge the parents and grandparents to a change of lifestyle. So now I've just been listening to you talking about subsidiarity there. And how does that relate to synodality? Mm. Synodality is, I think it's walking together, understanding that we're all together. I mean, it's more like Ubuntu, that everybody's in this on the same planet together or we're all in the same church together, or we're all in society together, and we have to listen to one another. Synodality is about listening um, and then walking together. It's not, synodality is not a question of decision-making. It's about being together on the same road, being Christians together, being in a family. We're, we're walking through our difficulties, our challenges together as a family. We're overcoming together. Um, so um, devolution of powers or, or decentralization is about, I think it's about decision making. It's about how do we come to a decision which is owned by everybody, which is everybody feels this is my, this is my decision as well. I belong to this and this decision belongs to me. And subsidiarity, sorry. Um, subsidiarity. No, no, the one going together, synodality. Is to me, yeah, this is here. Synodality is about we're all on the same road together. Let's let's listen to people whose decisions are going to be, whose lives are going to be affected. Let's listen to the laity. You know, the laity have perished the thought, actually have some experience about life. And we don't have to have they don't have to have decisions handed down to them from above. I see somebody is rubbing his nose at that strange idea that the laity may have opinions or have experience um okay all right uh thanks and that should we tackle mark's question if you just get to to then... tell me what this main part of the question is please well he says ubuntu as an african philosophy emphasizes interconnectedness and interdependence 
how can we reconcile such a beautiful idea with the reality of people who do not care for people outside their ethnic groups or do not see the connection between Ubuntu and the care for the earth? I mean, I think we, we have to be a little bit honest and say, you know, even in African society, there are people who deviate from the, from the ideal. Um, in Christian terms, we call that sin, or we call that human weakness, or we call it concupiscence or something like that. But even in African society, where we've got this beautiful idea of Ubuntu, 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 things like that, we've got these beautiful notions, but we don't always live up to the, the gold standard. We don't always live up to the idea which is presented to us or handed down to us from our ancestors or our, our immediate parents. Um, how do we deal with them? We just try to encourage people to live up to what is presented to us as the ideal. Um, we're Ubuntu, we're all, we're all interconnected. We've got selfish people in Africa as we have selfish people in the rest of the world. I think it's really important for us, and I've been teaching in Africa, I've been in teaching in Kenya for the last 10 years. We have people who are just as, um, just as venal, just as self-centered in Kenya as we have in the rest of the world. And, and so uh, we've got these romantic ideas, we romanticize them sometimes, but Mark's question is um, that, you know, we have to help them to embrace the reality which these ideas represent. There are people everywhere around the world who don't care. Not everyone is Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, any more questions? I don't see any hand or comments on the chat box or questions. So, Darinox, we have two minutes. Uh, could I ask you maybe to give us your parting shots before we thank the people? Well, you introduced you introduced something called Our Best Kept Secret, and that was a book published in the 1980s about Catholic social teaching by um, Peter Henry Peter and, and someone else. else. Okay, so I think... We had a telling conversation earlier that the Catholic social teaching is not presented um, as, as um, enthusiastically as it might be, possibly because we're focused on ideas of faith. What does faith mean? Faith means believing the Ten Commandments. Faith means kind of going to Mass on Sundays. Faith means kind of respecting the sacraments. And, and we have to kind of see that our faith has a wider social implication. We don't live in a vacuum. None of us is living in a little bubble or in, in a little island. And the Catholic social tradition gives us ways of being concerned about our brothers and sisters on this planet with whom we're sharing this space and being concerned for our, our earth, the mother, our mother earth or as, as Francis of Assisi calls it, sister mother earth. And we have to learn to treat our earth and our home as, as a sentient being, as something which really feels pain and which suffers when we, when we abuse it. Um, I think that's my parting shot. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ndarinox, for your insights and your words of wisdom. The, I hope uh, they were really helpful for many of us in this platform. And uh, thank, thank you, everybody, for joining us again this evening in this penultimatum uh, Lenten lecture on ecological conversion. So we will uh, hopefully see you again next Tuesday uh, for our last lecture when Dr. Knox will be taking us through on what can we do uh, on, uh, to really uh, change our lifestyles and change our way of doing things. Darren Knox, thank you again and have a good evening. Thank good night, everyone. everybody. Have a thank blessed you. evening and have a wonderful Holy Week starting next week. God bless.